Missoula. I'm your host, Scott Ramp, and I'm here to tell you about all the things that are happening within the city of Missoula and beyond for Wake Up Missoula. Let's talk a little bit about MCAT news. MCAT, we don't have a current facility in operation right now as at, as at the end of May. MCAT moved out of our current location, 500 North Higgins, and we'll be opening with the new library sometime in August. So that seems to be the plan going forward right now, but it, with everything that's been happening in the last couple months, it's very fluid, news is changing, different kinds of things are happening as well. So I'll let you guys know more and more about that later on. But I just wanted to announce a little bit more about that, is that MCAT is doing a lot more uh, programs with people. Um, we've been um, working with the city of Missoula uh, bringing their meetings live to our channel. Uh, Zoom meetings, uh, city and county and many other organizations have been using um, video calls and video group chats to uh, convey the message and have quorums. Uh, many uh, places as well is trying to figure out exactly how to get public comment out there. So a lot of city is asking folks to submit their public comment via email. They can call the number. Uh, you can find out the uh, phone number for public comment at the city's website, ci.missoula.mt.us. But if you want MCAP to come and shoot your rally, cause, concert, or anything like that, MCAT is available. Um, but usually we have a, a, a policy that we work with nonprofits within the city of Missoula. So if you're a nonprofit civic group, we work with you very well. Uh, we give up to 12 hours of free programming, so that means uh, the shooting, the editing, and the production process when it comes to creating the videos. Um, if you are an organization within the city of Missoula, you can contact with us at MCAT at MCAT.org, or you can call us at 542-6228. So that's my sales pitch. Now let's talk about some news items. Um, taxes. So that's a big thing that's happening, is that as we're going further and further into the fiscal year, which starts sometime in July, um, Many counties with, throughout the state of Montana have asked Representative Gianforte for money for infrastructure, which Greg Gianforte said that would be unlikely. Um, the U.S. federal uh, uh, government um, put in $3 trillion to be COVID, uh, the CARES Act, to help relieve the COVID-19 relief. Um, one of the things is because of the money coming into the state's iffy at best since the fiscal year of Montana begins in July, uh, which have which easily would have been able to uh, accomplish this if you were able to file taxes on April 15th, but it was extended to July 15th for IRS tax returns and all that stuff. Uh, Jane Forte says, we have to wait to see how the economy recovers and we should concentrate on opening businesses up again. Missoula County and other Montana communities like Helena are asking for the state's congressional delegation to relax some of the restrictions attached to the funding. Cash flow has taken a hit with a 1% ahead of last year in terms of delinquencies. And from the Missoula Current story, from MissoulaCurrent.com states there are about $2 million of delinquencies. Um, uh, County Chief Financial Officer uh, says penalties will show their ugly heads this fall, which will create a cash flow problem for the county. Gene Ferretti also mentions that infrastructure improvements may not, may not be part of the COVID-19 emergency funding. Of course, in U.S. news, um, one of the biggest things that are happening within the U.S. as well are all these uh, rallies, peaceful protests about... Um, George Floyd, and just recently this week is that uh, President Donald Trump signed an executive order to ban chokeholds by the police officers. Um, another big win is for the LGBTQ rights, as the Supreme Court ruled six to three in terms of protecting non-discrimination against people. So you can't be fired for being uh, uh, for someone for their sexual or gender identities. Uh, of course, later on the show, I have a package story for you guys about another population that's being overlooked and has been overlooked for many, many years, and is the Murdered and Missing um, Indigenous uh, Women's March. And I did a story package on it, and in which I will show you sometime after City Council report, so you can, guys can look for that. And one of the big things, it is the uh, it, it was in conjunction with the two-year anniversary of the disappearance of Jermaine Charlos two years ago. She would have been 25 this year. Of course, here are some new programs. They're going to be airing on MCAT, and then I'm going to talk about some other programs that are going to be airing on streaming services and uh, video games and stuff like that right after this. I believe that this is in the spirit of Aldo Leopold, who counseled us to think beyond ourselves and to consider how we as plain members of a larger community act and fit into our place in nature, what he calls for in his well-known land ethic. While officially incorporated as an NGO in 1993, 
The Blackfoot Challenge's origins date back to the early work of visionary landowners and managers like Lynn Lindbergh, John Stone, Hank Getz, Bill Potter, who in the 1970s saw opportunities to conserve and manage land, water, and wildlife in a more holistic and ethical way. This approach was based on the premise that cooperation is central to effective conservation. And I'd also like to quickly mention that since the recovery plan was written, our understanding of, of extinction has evolved quite a bit. Our understanding of their biology has evolved. And as Dave alluded to, the recovery plan needs to be updated. Um, a lot of people complain about this, um, saying that, well, you're moving the goalposts. You know, um, we had a goal, we had a goal of 50 bears for the cabinet yak. Now you're moving that. Um, but it's not a football game. And it's not, it's not a game at all, really. Um, it's, it's real-time science in a changing landscape, in a changing climate, with changing human and wildlife populations. It is her free will, it is her autonomy and her freedom to shape her life and fulfill herself according to her own will, rather than the will of others or the dictates of external circumstances. Today, we are privileged to have a distinguished panel to help us think about this important concept. And uh, isn't it timely uh, that we think about this issue at this time when the dignity of so many marginalized individuals throughout the world uh, is, is being challenged in so many different arenas? And so I'm hoping to learn what this can mean to us here in Montana. I have this in Mobile in my first case in private practice on the mega loads that were coming through Missoula. And during that time, I'd been training my side. I'd done immigration law in law school and was interested in it. And I saw it, it was touching on more and more things. And in Montana at the time, there were, let's see, three practicing immigration attorneys. Three for the entire state. Now there are five, believe it or not, with me and Randall Cottle. Randall describes it this way. He just moved here last year. And he's here in Missoula. He's one of my uh, colleagues, one of our colleagues with Montana's for Immigrant Justice. And we are super lucky to have him here. He ran a uh, six-person law firm in San Francisco, which is one of 40 immigration-specific law firms in San Francisco alone, in California. If that gives you an idea of how underserved the immigrant population in Montana was and continues to be. Yo guys, what's up? You like New York? Well, you're not gonna like this movie because it's about Staten Island, the worst of the New York. I don't know, I've never been to New York. Don't quote me on that. Don't take this out of context. Well, check out this. Um, it's about an adult man baby who refuses to grow up and must find a way to reconcile with the loss of his father while his mom begins to date a new guy who happens to be a firefighter who, who, uh, who just like his dad, um, his dad was a firefighter who died on duty. Um, Something tells me this movie has comedy and heart. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Buscemi, Steve Buscemi, is in this. Uh, Bill Burr is also in this, and he's kind of a jackass uh, of the story that kicks the king where he needs to be kicked. Pete Davidson stars in this movie where he plays the man baby, and I'm sure that Bill Burr character has a run-in with death makes the king boy, um, the main character of this movie, be like, you know what? Life is short. We, if we, what's the point of living if we can't live? And other things happen as well. Um, so it's life is fleeting. You have to be able to grow no matter how unsure the future is. So that's basically the lesson uh, of this movie. It's King of Staten Island. It's going to be streaming. Or it already is. I don't know. It, it, this, it, like, I, I pre-record this. 
Um, Love, Victor. We have a great story about a coming-of-age teenager who moves to a small town and tries to navigate high school um, and love. So uh, the, the purpose of the story is that he's looking for love, and like any uh, romantic teen comedy, it's always the one that's right in front of him. Take the glasses off, boom! That person who's been in front of you the whole time, that's the one you love, not the person you've been after, because the person you're after is is not as great as you, you set them up to be. You don't put them on a pedestal, blah, 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 you learn a lesson. Movies. Woo! That's a movie. It's called Love, Comma, Victor. Uh, the Last of Us Part 2. Let's talk about some video games. Last of Us. It's a game about a zombie apocalypse, right? That's original. So the movie, or... I'm sorry, the game is about a, a young girl who's all grown up from the previous game. Kind of sounds like the uh, Telltale um, Walking Dead game. Anyways, the, the, the thing starts out with a girl who's trying to survive zombies, but mostly she's trying to survive people. So enjoy the latest graphics in video games uh, as they try to tell a conveying story about spores that infect the planet and create zombies and monsters and stuff. But the real monster was the humans inside us the whole time. I think that's when the one they conveyed in the first game, but I think they're gonna, you know, whack this on the head a couple more times for this one. All right, guys. Well, I made a uh, dubbing stuff for you guys, and it is a very interesting dubbing stuff because it's from, let me see here, Convicts Code from the 1939 movie Convicts Code. And without further ado, here's this, and then I want to come back. Let's talk about some city council. <laughs> Oh, will you quit making that noise? Ugh, you're so annoying. Just stop. All right, we're here, honey. I just gotta get away from you. Uh, don't worry about this sign. What do you think you're doing over there? Oh, don't worry. If we take care of this sign, we don't have to be worried about being arrested. You sure about that? Uh, don't worry. It's just a minor uh, chemical spill. Come on, we're gonna have a picnic. It's gonna be fun. We might go swimming. Come on now. All right, let me put on the parking bro. Please stop. No. It's like I'm in a police academy movie. Ugh. All right, now get your butt out of here. We're gonna have a picnic, and it's gonna be fun. All right, all right, I'm coming. But if I get cholera, it's all your fault. You're just silly. Just walk it off. It's no big deal. Oh, this is heavy. Did you remember to bring sandwiches? I put the sandwiches right there. Uh, that's weird. I remember the weight distribution of plates, blankets, but I don't remember. I'm sure I put it in there. If it isn't in there, I'm calling the police. Oh, on lack of sandwiches? I don't think so, silly. Ugh. You forgot the sandwiches. I knew you'd forget the sandwiches. Well, did you make sure to bring the Wednesday picnic basket? No. You have picnic baskets for different days? Well, a daily picnic basket is for a small meal, but if you take it on the weekend, you need a big meal. <laughs> what do you think about that? You're being well, silly. Well, I guess I'm the stupid one, and you're the smart one. Well, you do pack your favorite Lunchables every day before you go to work. And besides, you should have known better to pack those sandwiches in the... I don't like it when we fight. Could you ever forgive me for my transgressions? Honey, don't worry. I've got you. Now, sit here. Hmm. Oh, you see? The sandwiches were inside you the whole time. Oh, gee, thanks. <laughs> you see all where the light touches the lake? That's all ours. But what about that shadowy place? Karen, you must never go there. Oh, but now I definitely want to go. How come you tell me that there are these wonderful places that I just can't go? It's just not fair. I'm just a wannabe emo girl. Let me tell you something about that dark place. That dark place is evil. It's a place where people go and they don't come back from. You can't go there. Please, promise me you will never go there. Oh, I definitely want to go now. I know you really want to go. But you have to trust me. This is... very dangerous. If you go, you may never come back. Do you understand? Uh, I understand. Listen, I'm not doing this so you can't sow your oats. I want you to sow your oats all over the place. Just not in the shadowy place. Do you understand? Mm-hmm. It's just so hard for me to take directions from a man.
kicking things off with some city council is a uh, an interesting story that happened within the city of Missoula where a young black teen within the city of Missoula was um, apprehended and chased down by a militia of, of protesters who say that they were there to uh, protect from looting. Um, Greg Martin uh, gave public comment on about the June 5th incident and this is what he had to say. But I wanted to express my disappointment that the mayor's letter to the Missoula community made no mention of the failure of the police in arresting an unarmed black man while he was being detained by armed white militia. It shows you everything you need to know about racism and why there are calls to defund police when a police department seems more willing to trust a group of rogue militants with guns than a man they are holding against his will. Why is it that those armed white militia members somehow had more protection and trust than the unarmed man they arrested? Secondly, it has been more than a year since I addressed the council about the forgotten history of St. Paul AME Church, the black church in Missoula that was active for nearly three decades. You may recall in the article I wrote of the racism this group experienced as soon as they moved into the old old school building. <clears throat> the Fourth Ward Improvement Club threatened to boycott any real estate agent or homeowner who sold or rented to black people in the West Side. While that did not prevent the church from staying at that location on Phillips Street, it had to have had a chilling impact on the desirability of Missoula as a welcoming place for black people to live. In 1910, when the church started, it represented the seed of potential for a vibrant black community here. In 1910, 95% of all black people still lived in the South. But during the years of the Great Migration, Missoula's black dropped while its white pot. The AME church, as I have mentioned, twice had their services interrupted by our own chapter of the Ku Klux Klan. With the rogue armed militia on the courthouse on June 5th, these white road vigilantes claimed they were there to support the church and the black community. But we all know what message they were really trying to send. You see, what happened on Friday is not much different than what happened over 100 years ago in this town. That is why I find it imperative for the city to support efforts to remember this church and what it represents. Of course, this is about a year since he gave his first public comment, and I also interviewed Greg Martin to talk a little bit more about the AME Church that happened within the city of Missoula. The AME Church was one of the first uh, founding churches founded by uh, black people within the city of Missoula, but also around the same time with the expansion uh, to get away from the racist South and try to go for uh, greener pastures. Um, also, the Ku Klux Klan came to Missoula, and uh, they also kind of had... And, of course, Greg mentions is that there are a lot of similarities between the groups. I interviewed Greg Martin last year, and you guys can check this out. Uh, Wake Up, uh, you can look up on my channel, Wake Up Missoula, to find this interview that I had with Greg Martin last year when he spoke about this forgotten history. And you can learn more about by looking to his blog. The keywords are Missoula's Forgotten Black History, Hidden, Hiding in Plain Sight. Of course, Julie Merritt reflects on folks carrying guns across the... Uh, uh, county courthouse saying that they were there to protect. A number of people have said that they were there, the, the people with the guns were there to protect others, but but they ended up hurting the very people, the very tight, you know, person that they were supposed to be protecting, a young black man. And it's, uh, it's just devastating that I don't think a lot of people understand the lasting impact that an assault like that can have on people. I mean, um, it, it, chances are, I mean, everyone's different in how they deal uh, with trauma, but chances are it's gonna stick with that young man for a long time. And um, I hope, I know that he's got a lot of family support and support in the community. So I hope that that um, carries him through and uh, helps him heal from this trauma. Um, but the, the gun should not have been tolerated. Um, I, I, th I think that we need to have a, a serious conversation about um, crossing the line from uh, legal open carry into illegal intimidation. And I hope that that can be part of the conversations that we have in the future. And the last thing I wanted to say about this is that uh, Greg Martin also wants to create a mural, and he wants people to give some support to create a mural to kind of reflect Missoula's kind of iffy past within the city of Missoula to kind of um, talk about... Um, a blotch in Missoula's history. That Okay, so moving on, uh, I want to talk a little bit more about uh, um, one of the things 
and that's affordable housing. Affordable housing is such a huge uh, part of Missoula, and Missoula is trying really hard to kind of convey uh, high density housing, working for federal assistance. Uh, Max Larson brings up another public comment issue that about Missoula's creation of a new funding source uh, for affordable housing trust fund, um, and this is what Max Larson had to say. The budget for this has not been capped, and there is there is no cap on the budget, I should say, as far as I've read in all of this 20-page document, um, or maybe it's more than that, it's like 20-some-odd pages. Anyway, I'd like to know, <clears throat> how do you conclude that $10 million will solve uh, Missoula's affordable housing issue in perpetuity? Um, and what is the budget? Um, will the admin, who will the admin staff be? Do we already employ staff on the city that do this type of, that, that already do this job? Um, isn't the affordable housing trust essentially the same thing as MRA? Um, so why are we creating a redundant agency? Um, and also, what, what happens to the other organizations in the private sector if we're just clamping down and creating this affordable housing trust fund? Um, <clears throat> we're already being told by, you know, the, the powers that be that the general fund is not enough to, to cure our road problems and to, to, to suffice for what it's supposed to suffice for. Um, so how am I to believe that this affordable housing trust fund is anything but a slush fund um, that's being created and a new bureaucracy that's being created um, that's already draining again from an already drained general fund? Of course, I looked up this trust fund a little bit more about this, and this is going to be um, conveyed and uh, funneled through the Montana Department of Commerce, and it is the money f um, from the federal level to keep up with the need for affordable housing. Um, uh, the Commerce is taking point at direction grants that will go to local communities based on need. So they assess the needs, especially the, um, the uh, quantity of people who need to find affordable housing, and that's what they are working on moving forward as well. But also one of the things that uh, the city is also trying to do, um, I'm going to change the subject right now, and Brian von Lochberg uh, has worked on creating a new listening committee to reflect on the times we're living in a Zoom um, online meeting source, and Brian Lonversberg wants to make it easier for people to uh, give public comment and create a forum, but also uh, have people lead the forum and not uh, while the city council facilitates these forums for people to have a uh, discussion within the community. And this is what he had to say. And that our existing committee structure and processes themselves provide an impediment for, I think, hearing people uh, in this moment, at this time, the way people need to be hear, heard. And so I want to be, this is very intentional. We're not creating a subcommittee of one of our existing committees. We're creating this ad hoc committee uh, to get as far from that structure and those processes, frankly, as we can with the intent to be better able uh, to, to listen to the community. The point of these meetings will be for deep listening and for people within the community to engage the city of Missoula City Council members as well. We live in a very interesting time where social distancing is such a huge thing that we're trying to figure out this particular meeting to kind of increase uh, community connections and beyond. So, um, another buzzwords. All right, anyways, um, Murder Becerra kicks off a story I did on missing and murdy, murdered indigenous women's march that happened Tuesday evening. So here is a Murder Becerra uh, talking a little bit about that. Um, but this also concludes my city council report. So before I hand it off to Murder Bercera from the city council member, uh, I just want you guys to know that, as always, you can go to ci.missoula.mt.us. Take it away, Murder. Um, tomorrow is um, the second year anniversary of Jermaine Charlo's um, disappearance. And I, I think that um, among everything that's happening right now, I would like for all of us to not keep um, sight of this um, sad uh, state of affairs for our native uh, members of the community. And um, just just keep that in mind and reach out to anyone that you know who uh, might have a connection. Thanks. People gathered at Sacagawea Park to march for missing and murdered indigenous women. 
We're in red to symbolize the lives that were lost, with no justice and explanation to those disappearances. And the youth come to me with a question to help, and they're to help. So um, I want to introduce Shayla, who is a dynamic, charismatic young woman. She has been living out of state, um, and she wanted to do something um, tangible for her cousin to raise awareness for murder missing indigenous women. I find it kind of ironic that we're meeting in Sacagawea Park because Pocahontas and Sacagawea were the first romanticized murdered missing and indigenous women. Um, we, have in, we have romanticized this history of the fact that these women were taken, stolen, and trafficked. And so we're here meeting at Sacagawea Park, one of the first murdered m missing well-known women. And so I think that um, Really excited to see young, young women like Shayla, the youth, stepping up and wanting to do something and, and to empower themselves by empowering their community. All right, I just want to say a few words. Jermaine and I were two peas in a pod. Our age gap was humongous. I always wanted to be by her side. I always wanted to be like her. I miss our petty fights and stealing her clothes. I miss walking with her. I miss her. I want to shine light to the missing and murdered indigenous people. Indigenous women are ten times more likely to be killed than average natural murder rate. Our women there's over 5,700 people who have been missing, and only 116 of them have been filed as officially missing persons. Our walk is to remember all of them, every single one of them. Our walk will begin here. We will walk up Orange Street, and we will take a right on Broadway Street to Badlander Bar. Badlander Bar was the last place Jermaine was seen at. We will then continue to Higgins Avenue and back to this park. I just, I just want to thank every single one of you for supporting me and my family because this is hard. Jermaine Charlo is from Dixon, Montana and the mother of two. She went missing two years ago and would have been 25 this year. Hundreds marched from the park across Orange Street Food Farm to the Badlander in downtown Missoula. Okay, can you hear me? All right, so I'm going to do a really, really quick chant. I know this is not a protest, this is not a celebration, but I'm just, you know, we're here for justice, we're here for answers. And so I'm going to say, what do we want? You're going to say justice. Justice for our sisters. What do we want? Justice! When do we want it? Now! What do we want? Justice! When do we want it? Now! What do we want? Justice! When do we want it? Now! <laughs> from there, they march back to the park from downtown Missoula. The public can help in a ground search Friday. Anyone attending is asked to meet Grey Wolf Peak Casino at 1 p.m. to search until 4. Scott Ramph from Missoula, Montana. Well, we're definitely making some good time here with my morning show. I have a lot of clips, a lot of stuff to show you, but there wasn't necessarily as much talking as I would usually do in most of my other shows. Um, but there's definitely a lot of stuff that is happening within the city and the United States that are, that are going on and are currently going on. Um, Many of my sources I like to go to is uh, CNN, a little bit of Fox News, uh, NPR.org, um, Missoula Current, Missoulian, uh, KPAX, KCI. I just try to like 
try to find many of the different angles just to kind of have an idea and a sense of what's going on within the city of Missoula and just got to convey it. We're, a lot of us are kind of stuck inside. There's not much going on here. Uh, we're still currently in phase two of the COVID-19 dealio that's happening within the city of Missoula. And part of that is that restaurants, as they're opening up, they're at 72 com percent capacity. If you haven't noticed, there's a lot of places that are just like, uh, keeping a good social distance between tables um, at restaurants and whatnot. People have put up um, walls, um, basically just kind of like, uh, I guess, a splash wall in a way. It kind of feels like you're at a Gallagher um, a comedy show. I don't know, that's that's probably a reference that n no one my age or younger or even some people who are older than me won't even get. So anyways, uh, I just want to thank you guys for joining me for this morning show. Um, and take care. Um, it's going to be a very interesting weekend as well, and I'll have more for you guys next week, so I'll see you guys later. Bye-bye.